Welcome to the High Bar, your weekly watering hole for lighthearted conversation with people who care about culture that matters. I'm Warren Etheridge, your host and barkeep. I promise never to cut anyone off while encouraging all to think responsibly. Today, join me and my guest, the two-time Oscar winner, actress and filmmaker and director of the new movie, The Beaver, Jodie Foster, as we raise a toast to and raise the bar for mental health. It is estimated that over 16% of Americans will suffer some form of chronic depression in the course of their lifetime. That said, it's something that we rarely ever talk about. Thankfully, the new movie, The Beaver, does raise the issue one more time, and to extend that conversation, we have the lovely, talented, and whip-smart filmmaker, <laughs> Jodie Foster. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for extending the conversation, too. Clearly an important oh, it's a It's a movie I love, you know, and uh, it's touching and, uh, and strange in lots of ways. <laughs> uh, you know, it has a, an odd tone to it, and, and if you're somebody that likes movies that are unusual, this one's for you. I, I like strange, and it's certainly the most uplifting film that I never thought would be. Right. Yeah, so it has an, uh, it, it's an interesting transition. We start out with a man who's really broken and who's um, suffering from such terrible depression that he can't even get out of bed or speak. And uh, just uh, as he tries to commit suicide and fails, uh, he finds a puppet, puts it on his hand, and suddenly starts speaking through it, and, and he's found the survival tool for him that allows him to live again. And clearly it's about him and his battle with depression, but mm -hmm. I'm curious, who has it worse, the clinically depressed or those who love the clinically depressed? I don't know if it's worse, but it definitely affects everyone. Uh, this, this film is actually told in two parts. There's a father story and there's a son story. And uh, the son hates his father and doesn't want to be like him. But as we know, uh, depression is genetically bad. There's a genetic predisposition. He's worried that he's going to be just like his father because he shares all these other traits. He's going to end up being a big loser like his dad, too. And he spends the whole movie trying to avoid him and stay away from him and not be on the same path. And of course, their paths are converging little by little. Right, but you can't avoid depression. You can't, and the film talks about it in a broad spectrum. You know, we talk about uh, a very serious chemical depression, a real illness, a medical illness that needs to be attended to medically. Uh, that's Walter Black's story. And we talk about um, sadness, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, belongs to all of us, uh, grief and, and how hard life is and how, how much heavier it gets as the years go on. And what do you do with all of that emotion? And, and the, the answers are similar. The answers are the same, which is, you know, we don't have to be alone. Now, you've been wonderfully open and cagey at the same time in yeah. interviews by saying that you have dealt with depression sure. in your past. Yeah. But is that something that you've dealt with personally or the people around you? I think all the above, um, and in my family as well, and uh, it definitely runs in my family. Uh, I like to say, though, that, I, that apparently if you, there's, a, there's a category called an obsessive ruminator, and I feel like, wow, that's me. I'm an obsessive ruminator. I like to think about dark things and think about them over and over and over again, and uh, I like to stare at my ceiling and think about them and why this happened, and do you think it happened because of this? And um, That process of rumination, I think, is an incredibly artistic process, and I, I look at it as a gift uh, that uh, you're able to look at a spiritual crisis, look at a, a very dark thing, and find your way through it, not by running away from it, right. but by running right through it, and I think that allows you to be a more evolved person. So I, I see in some ways there is a depressed part of my personality that's, that's pretty uplifting. Well, that's a, it's, it's a great thing that you get that creativity, artistic, it's lemonade of sorts that you've made out of that. But, but the ruminating is sort of spiraling downwards. I'm only saying this because I relate. I, it does, <laughs> it does. And uh, it's tough on everybody around you. And it makes you more and more solitary. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a roller coaster. Life's a roller coaster. And there's tragedy and there's comedy. And hopefully if you, uh, if you really want to embrace one, you have to embrace the other. Well, you know, in, in the movie we have Walter Black who seeks a very unusual form of treatment, yes. uh, but we look at the numbers and 80% of the people out there who are suffering with depression right now do not get treatment. Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a hand puppet that helps you. Well, in fact, I would say <laughs> don't go for the hand puppet. Don't go, go, for, for, go for somebody <laughs> better than that. Go for that. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it's a serious illness, and um, we work with an organization called NAMI hmm. uh, that works uh, you know, this is a very, very targeted, very targeted way with uh, mental illness. and. Um, there, uh, you know, depending on what you have, really, there are different ways of going about it. But the, the number one thing is to make sure that you know that you're not alone, and that there are other people that have experienced this too, and to really seek out that connection. Well, that sounds fantastic. But is it just talk and tolerance that pulls somebody through? Those loved ones coming around? Uh, that has to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in in Walter's case, he needs. He needs much bigger help than that. He needs a lot of drugs and a sanitarium, and uh, hopefully he finds that at the end of the movie. Right. I just think it's amazing because in the movie your character is certainly 
wonderfully tolerant in my mind, very, very giving in a way that I can't see myself <laughs> necessarily. Well, um, you know, she loves him, and when you love somebody who's struggling, you don't run away from them. You know, you fight for them. Uh, there does come a point where she gives up on him. She gives up on him twice in the movie. And there, there comes a point where she's finally had it, and, uh, and it's when his uh, illness is starting to destroy her sons. Mm -hmm. And that's a place where she draws the line, you know, not my sons, you will not do this to my sons. And she takes her children out of the situation, which seems to me like the responsible thing to do. That is a responsible thing. Who, who is more misunderstood, the, the chronically depressed or the incredibly famous? That's a real <laughs> question. I don't know. That's I, a real I, uh, question. Oh, one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You know, um, well, the chronically depressed are definitely misunderstood, <laughs> but uh, they have an opportunity to be. I suppose uh, what's difficult about being a public person is that um, the most private things that you hope are private and intimate and shared with people you love um, are, you know, uh, are, are worth money. So sometimes they find themselves on YouTube. Well, I love your quote about that uh, you don't mind seeing somebody in their underwear, yeah. but you don't like seeing somebody in their underwear against their will. That's right. Somehow you manage to avoid that. What is the secret? <laughs> what is the secret to that? Sleep in pajamas, I think, <laughs> is, is, the, uh, is the answer. I don't know. Yeah, I've been in this business for an incredibly long time, right. and because I was a child actor, I started at the age of three. Uh, I'm sure I developed a coping mechanism. You know, I developed a survival tool that allowed me to get through this unscathed. Uh, and that survival tool has, you know, made me as nutty as a fruitcake. And you, I have heard that quote before. But you don't seem nutty at all. I don't seem like it, do I? <laughs> no, you don't. But you really are, aren't you? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I say it affectionately. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I do believe that I've found a way to, to cope with things and that I'm pretty well adjusted. I mean, I'm not squawking like a chicken. Good. But, um, yeah, I'm, I have an unusual psyche. <laughs> that's, that's what you're known for. That's what I'd say on your trading cards. That's, certainly. that's but, right. <laughs> I mean, I say, you know, like if you're going to be an astronaut, mm -hmm. um, some people mm -hmm. uh, don't mind being confined in tight spaces, so they like spacesuits, and some people like being alone a lot, so traveling around in space all by yourself is great for them. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are not built for it, and there are a lot of people who are not built to be in the public eye, and that's where it's really destructive. Um, very often you may have a very talented person, but who is not psychologically built to be under the microscope like that, and that's where somebody gets destroyed. Well, that's, that's uplifting right there. <laughs> you, but you have been exposed both through the movies and, uh, and seemingly through life a little bit to crazy people out there. Mm -hmm. And I think back to uh, Travis Bickle. Okay. And, and part of me thinks that Travis Bickle is sort of what Walter Black would have been back in the 70s. That he's internalized it rather than externalized it. Mm, I don't know. He might be a different kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he might be a different kind of crazy. Um, but there is a theme, which is aloneness, you know, mm -hmm. of feeling like nobody, there is nobody there for you. And uh, I see that in so many of my movies. It must be something I'm really attracted to. So I guess that's, that's probably maybe the one connection between the two. So you would be good at space travel? I think I would be good at space travel. Yeah. I like MRIs. You know. I like MRIs. I like being. T I, I like yeah. sometimes when I get in an airplane, mm -hmm. I take my seatbelt and I put my hands underneath it and I do it really tight. <laughs> and then that gives me like a really safe feeling. I like that. It really does. It does. I'm the person scratching at the wall of the plane <laughs> at some point, but you actually lock yourself in tight. Yeah, I actually like claustrophobia, which is odd. That is odd. Yeah. But now, the thing about uh, space travel, I also understand that you're going to do a science fiction film. I am. I'm going to do a film with Neil Blomkamp, who's the uh, director of District 9, mm -hmm. an absolutely perfect movie, uh, with Matt Damon. With Matt Damon. Okay. Yeah. And you'll say no more about it. You won't talk uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say much more about it. In fact, they won't even give me the script. I've read the script. They, they <laughs> took it out of my hands quickly, and they won't even give me a script. Really? But is that part of your love, doing Contact and doing this? Is that? No, I think those are the only two sci-fi movies I'll, I'll have ever done. But um, I like exploring, you know, interesting themes in every different genre. I'm a big movie lover, so I like musicals, I like sci-fi, I like horror films, I like them all. Is everything going to be okay? <laughs> no. In no. fact, it's not. <laughs> it is not. There's a theme in the movie no. where uh, a question, which is, you know, everybody keeps telling you, your doctors, your lawyers, your parents, Everything's okay. It's all going to be okay. And what if it isn't? Uh, it's a good question for us that, um, that you know, life does come with these tragedies that can't be fixed with, you know, a Tylenol PM. Right. And, uh, you know, you will have to endure them and you will have to come to understand them. But what gets you through? Art. 
I think I think art gets me through um, art and connection. You know, love and art, and they're not dissimilar. What about the general public? What gets them through? Because I always like that line: everything is going to be okay. It sounds mm. okay. It does sound good. It sounds it's better. Sure. It makes you feel it better, doesn't it? Uh, the general public, which gets them through? I, I, you know, I, more episodes of American Idol. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I do. Just a bad doubt. Americans should go shopping in times of crisis and watch more TV. Is that <laughs> it? Exactly. I'm sure that's exactly what Obama would say. There, uh, Shop <laughs> more, more TV. <laughs> See, nothing would have been different That's true. if he'd just been elected sooner. <laughs> Same picture. No, but so, there's got to be something. I mean, if, if there is tragedy, I, I'm curious because mm. seemingly on record you're at least an agnostic. Yes. So yes, what, yes. Give, what gives you the faith that somehow you're going to get through that stuff and there's going to be something better on the other side? Or do you not even care about the stuff that's better on the other side? The other side meaning after you're dead? No. No, just the other side. The other side of the, other side um, of the tragedy. I believe that life is beautiful and uh, for miraculous and unknown reasons. I don't need to call them God or I don't need to find mystical or magical reasons for them, but I think that life is beautiful and I think it's worthwhile. But doesn't that mean everything's going to be okay? No, it doesn't. It? <laughs> <laughs> but if you believe in it, that there's something beautiful and something worthwhile, mm. then everything's going to be okay. Well, on the flip side, everything is okay it is, you know, maybe everything isn't okay as well at the same time. I think life's much more complicated than that. It's more complicated than that. And if you really, really want to experience great heights of joy, then you have to be willing to embrace, you know, great depths of darkness too. But see, once again, there's a trade-off. There is a compromise. You're not just saying experience great depths of, of, of sorrow. And, and nothing and, else? Right. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. Yeah. Whatever, yeah, you're right. 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 It's not just a Russian novel. It actually yeah, it does, does pick up at some point. It does pick up, thank God. You don't Somewhere around page 458. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to give anything away about the beaver, but like, there is a choice to actually give us some hope. Yeah, the, yeah, it is. I think it's a hopeful film in a lot of ways, and I think it's about people who are struggling and who, who do actually make it through, mm -hmm. and uh, that struggle is worthwhile. And I, I guess that is the message of the movie, is that the struggle is worth something. The struggle is it's not pointless. And we're not doomed if we're related to depressed people. I have a lot not of suicide in my family. And not at all. No, no, yeah. not at all. I mean, there is a genetic component to depression. We all know that. But, um, you know, there's, there's lots you can do to not only to overcome it, but in, in some ways to use it to your benefit. How do we nurture this group around us? Because you make it sound so nice. Like you have to have your friends, your connections. Mm -hmm. so that, how, how do you nurture that? If you're somebody who likes to be claustrophobic, it doesn't sound like you're getting out there that much. <laughs> You, you mean, should we, should I just go to bars or something? Well, I don't know. Um, about this one, the high bars. So this bar is definitely <laughs> worth going to. Um, Thank you. Chapel Bar I, in Seattle. I guess, you know, it's keep talking. You just keep talking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not an easy thing to do, I think, when you're a depressed person. It's just not an easy thing to do. How do you find the right people to, like, see you through? Because I've always found in crisis that there's some people you never expect to come through, mm -hmm. and then the people you really counted on often crap out on you. Oh, that might be true. That might be true. <laughs> I, um... I guess it's an intuition, mm -hmm. I think, that, um, I don't know, I, I think I'm also kind of optimistic, and mm -hmm. I'm opti very optimistic about human connection, mm -hmm. and um, I, uh, I really love intimate moments with people. I like meeting somebody on a plane, and even though sometimes I don't like to talk on a plane, every once in a while I'll meet somebody on a plane, and I'll have a life-changing conversation. And it's meaningful, and it's something that I'll remember always. I probably will never call them again. I don't need to ever know them. Right. But that doesn't mean that that moment didn't happen. Right. And um, I guess, I don't know, that's my philosophy. So you know. if you see Jody strapped down in a plane, that's <laughs> take your shot. <laughs> that's a way to go. Yeah. Okay. So you, you, you have this, this, this group surrounding you, and, and you trust in them, but you also have kids now. Yes. Has that changed your outlook on, on, on mental health? I think it has, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, 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 well, first of all, they're an incredible, they have an incredible learning curve built mm -hmm. into them because you learn so much of your, about yourself, the good, the bad, and the ugly, really, about yourself by, by interacting with them and by having to be responsible for somebody and knowing that your life means something more than just you. Um, and there, there's a real responsibility that comes with that, you know, of wanting to you know, give them all the opportunities in the world to be healthy, happy people. But um, I learn stuff from my kids every day. It's quite amazing. I learn from my daughter all the time. And one of the things I, I, I see is that some of these neuroses I have that I found so charming in myself are not nearly as charming in her. But I also worry for her, passing, mm -hmm. on, passing these things on. Like yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I, I, now, as the kids grow older, I worry about them less and less. And I know that it should be true, but I worry about them less and less because I realize they're really great guys. Mm -hmm. And um, that even if I wanted to, 
I couldn't squeeze that out of them. You know, they are these, the, they walk the way they walk. They're totally independent of me in so many ways. And there are already people that I admire. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing. Yeah. If they were ever going through depression, what would you do? Would you like quickly get them to a hospital or would you just coddle it's them? Absolutely, depending on, you know, what, what it is. But uh, I wouldn't let go, that's for sure. I have this thing I say to my, uh, I've been saying to my niece forever, but now I've decided to start saying it to my kids because they're old enough to not take it the wrong way. But I say, if you ever take a machine gun and kill a bunch of people, <laughs> I just want you to know I will call the police, but I'll be there at the jail every single day of your life. <laughs> my son said the other day, because he doesn't like to butter his own bread at 12 and a half years old, mm -hmm. and he's like, will you butter my toast and bring it to me? I said, absolutely, no problem. He said, so, so he said, if I call you on the phone and I go, Mom, get the toast ready, you're going to know what that means? I said, absolutely, yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> I guess I'm more disturbed. Why have you been saying this to your niece? Um, <laughs> Should the FBI have some sort of watch on her? Because she was point? old enough. No, okay. no, she's a good kid, but she was old enough to, to not take the words machine gun and use them in the wrong way. <laughs> Whereas the boys would. Well, yeah, yeah, they were definitely not old enough to hear that. But you, you, you do believe in that. You're a very loyal person. I am, yeah, and I, you know, I, I am a loyal person. I know where this is going. What? No, no, I'm not, no I, won't even, I won't even do that. No. that. That's not important to mm -hmm. me. But where does that loyalty come, come from? Have you had that? Have you experienced that yourself? Has there been somebody there who's always been there for you? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think my mom was to some extent. To some extent, and then not to others in ways that I had hoped. Like every disappointed teenager, you know, there were ways that, that um, she didn't live up to my expectations. And then I had to grow up, damn it, and become an adult and figure it out myself. Uh, but yeah, I, I, feel like that, I feel like friendship is a sacred thing. And um, that, you know, you're there for people's struggles. And um, it doesn't mean, I don't know, it, 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 it's not a burden. You know? It's not a burden. I think in some ways that's the best news is to be able to give back. You say it with an incredible lack of judgment. Are you non-judgmental? You know, if like you were somebody that knew me really well, you'd, you'd say that I'm the most judgmental person in the world. I don't think I am at all. I think that I am, I like to figure people out, mm -hmm. but I don't judge them. But I like to say, oh, he does that because of this, and he does that annoying thing because of that. Mm -hmm. I like to spend a lot of time kind of dissecting people. And um, some of my friends think that's just mental. I don't think it's just mental. I, think I don't it's think it's just mental. I think it's just, I'm interested. I think I like to study characters and I think yeah. I do the same thing. It's yeah. not judgment, you're just figuring them out. That's right. You're that's in the right. clear. That's right. Do you Why do you don't you tell everybody else? Would you write that down on a piece of paper and sign it so I can give that to people? <laughs> no. I get a lot of grief <laughs> so about it. So it's not judgmental? Sure. Sure, it's not judgmental, really. I'll, I'll back up on that one. <laughs> but you do sometimes. There has to be somebody who crosses a line. You have to have some lines. It's like, that is not okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a door slammer that way, where I do reach the, the, you know, I do reach the straw on the camel's back, and then I just, I just cut off, which is also a bad thing to do. Really? Yeah. It's dramatic, at least. It's very dramatic. I do it in a really quiet, waspy, reserved way, though. <laughs> it would be better if I did it in a more Italian way. That would be nice. Yeah. Uh, but this idea of slamming the door is, is intriguing to me. Like, what would do it? Because it seems like if, if somebody can go in and mow down people at a, a school, like Virginia Tech or something, mm -hmm. and you'd be there, mm -hmm. uh, you've got pretty wide berth with you. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean... But you've walked out on interviews. Have I? How yes. long? How old was it? Was I like 21? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I was like 21. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's it's hard. Uh, yeah, it's. I don't know. It depends what it is, I suppose. Uh, it depends what the intention is, you know. And it depends uh, where the passion comes from. Okay. So we are so good and crafty, <laughs> <laughs> answering everything, but not quite directly. I like it. Uh, so you, you just seem mentally healthy, grounded, and I'm just trying to figure out your way into this movie. Um, I mean, you know, if I am mentally healthy and grounded, it's because I've, I think about all this stuff a lot and I work through this stuff a lot and, you know, I have my own special circumstances and, you know, we talk about the beaver, the puppet, as a survival tool. It's, uh, it's this wonderful thing that allowed him to survive, that allowed him to live again and allowed him to be vital and to get through an otherwise untenable experience. Um, but the survival tool does its own damage. 
and uh, eventually, in our story, the survival tool has got to go because yes. the survival tool is, tool is <laughs> killing him and, and destroying his family. Uh, and in my, you know, my work has been my survival tool. You know, working out my problems through making films, through examining them and examining the characters, and giving everybody that birth of acceptance. You know, you did this bad thing that affected this other person in this way. But I see you did it for these very complicated reasons that are true to you. And um, when you're able to understand somebody, you can forgive them in a way. You know? What about the role of intelligence in mental health? I think that it seems like it might make it tougher. I have, this sounds bad, and I'm sure that I will not be backed up by all the <laughs> professionals out there. But yeah, I think it makes it a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like uh, intelligence is not always your friend. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard. It's it's hard to see that much, and, and sometimes uh, an emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which I think is a different type of intelligence that's even more painful. Mm -hmm. um, seeing too much, you know, experiencing too much, feeling too much, um, is is a burden. So we I'm should like, try to lower the EQ of our children. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, the character in Little Man Tate, uh, mm -hmm. Fred right. Tate, the little boy. I mean. He, he's obviously he's an intellectual, he's, he does incredible with math, he's a child prodigy, he plays piano, um, but mostly what's extraordinary about him is his emotional intelligence, and um, that is the part that, that breaks his heart, and it's the part that makes his life so difficult, because he feels everything, and he feels things that, he, that, a, that a seven year old boy shouldn't feel. So you are championing ignorance is bliss to some extent. Yes, ignorance yes. is bliss. <laughs> but he can't go get back. The he can't go back. <laughs> get the lobotomy. <laughs> Jody said get the lobotomy. <laughs> That's nice. It should go on a button, a bumper sticker. <laughs> I'll work on that, certainly. In, by the year 2020, mm -hmm. uh, clinical depression is said to be, it may be the second most common health problem in the world. Wow. What? <laughs> you did your research. I, I, well. <laughs> I'm depressed. I, I had, had lots of time while I wasn't <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> what should people do to, to reverse that trend? Number one, go see the Beaver and yeah, go absolutely. visit the website yeah. afterwards, the Beaver slash movie dot com. Multiple exactly. times, bring friends, family, yes, yes. take a um, whole group out from the sanitarium. Yeah, I keep talking. I mean, that's it. I think keep connecting and keep talking and don't give up. Um, and you know, it does. It even though it's it seems. You know, in some ways, you have to trust the people who say it will get better. It does get better, and um, that's hard to do. Trust. I, I assume that you did research for this movie as well. You seem yes. like a, a, a reader. So, can you recommend, you know, a book or a movie or two no. that? No, <laughs> I can't. I can't remember anything. I have a Nothing. small memory problem. Uh, you know, I, I obviously I looked at a lot of things, and mm -hmm. I, in fact, mm -hmm. I think the best one I read was Depression for Dummies. Really? There is a depression for dummies, mm -hmm. and um, if you're depressed, you probably do not want to read that much. <laughs> so you should go out and buy Depression for Dummies because it's just very, very clear and succinct. And, uh, and it doesn't become self-fulfilling prophecy. Like I don't want to know more because then I feel like I just buy into the stuff. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's <laughs> it. I'm, you know, a lot of people who are depressed say, "I can't listen to music, I can't see movies, and I can't read because I don't want to start crying." I just like once I start, I can't stop, so I can't. I just can't do any of those things. That's kind of a weird, self-fulfilling prophecy, which is you know, you suck everything emotional out of your life, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to feel emotion, and then you're incapable of really f having a healthy emotion. Uh, you know, it's a it's a vicious cycle. I've seen that with friends who are depressed, who either medicated or got treatment to the point where they were sucking the emotion out, and then frankly, they weren't fun to be around. No. And I don't think they were having fun. Like the highs and lows seem better. I'm sure that's not <laughs> clinically safe or anything, but <laughs> but it seems like you have to go live with it. I think you well, you know, I, the, the, it's not it's 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 not romantic. We know mm -hmm. that it's not romantic, and there are aspects of it that are positive, and most aspects of it, there's nothing positive that comes out of depression. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's uh, it really is about uh, about. You know, a series of pieces that come together, not just connecting with your friends, not just talk therapy, and not just medication. It has to be a combination of all those things. So people can read Depression for Dummies. I'm going to recommend the movie Helen with Ashley Judd, which I think is fantastic, directed by Sandra Nedelbuck. And of course, The Beaver, which is going to open here in Seattle May 6th. Uh, but elsewhere, it's just going to be playing constantly, just around the world. For the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> just a loop of the beaver on planes everywhere where you'll be strapped in tight. And if you can just say the beaver a lot to mm -hmm. everybody around you, 
you'll be less depressed because they will laugh in your face. <laughs> That's right. It makes you giddy. <laughs> the beaver, the beaver, the beaver. Very no, irreverent. We the like that. beaver dash movie dot com. Yes. The fabulous Jodie Foster. Thank you. You've made me happy. Everything Good. is going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. It's my mantra now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Here.